It was a tale of two seasons, one interrupted by tragedy, another heralded in triumph. A season of uncertainty and doubt, memorialized by the most spectacular play. It began as it always does, with hard work, pain, sacrifice, and hope. A determined coach, a talented, unproven team, fans hungry to win, and then, day by day, game by game, the LSU Tigers became a dream team. This is their story, the real story, told by the people who played the game. It's the inside story about a great season. It's a story about football, the way it was meant to be played, the way it was meant to be coached. It's a true story about how the LSU Tigers became champions. On a hot and humid September 1st night, the rain let up long enough for a football game in Tiger Stadium. As lightning flashed in the distant skies, the LSU Tigers opened the season against the Tulane Green Wave and decisively won their sixth straight season opener. Well, Tulane was a, was a real challenge, especially for a first game because you know, they use a no huddle offense, which is a much more difficult management for the defensive team because every player, every person gets in a routine. I mean, you get up in the morning, you have a cup of coffee, you eat a Debbie cookie, and you know, you take a shower and you're off to work. And if anybody, if there's not any Debbie cookies or there's no coffee, I mean, it upsets everyone. So a defensive player does the same thing. He goes to the huddle, he gets the call, he breaks the huddle, he looks at the offense come out. And he says, coach said if they're in this formation that they run these plays. Well, now when it's no huddle, he doesn't have the same time to go through the same process. It was really tough, and it was tough to get ready for. It was hard to get the scout team to, to uh, you know, simulate no huddle uh, to the extent that we really got better. And, uh, and to me, the biggest challenge in the two-lane game was getting lined up. They did a great job of just keeping us off balance, I mean, you know, giving us different looks and not being able to substitute. We wanted to get off to a great start in the game. Uh, we, took the, we took the ball, we took the kickoff return about 65 yards, uh, scored on the first or second play from scrimmage. So we established the tempo of the game right off the bat. And I think that's very important when you're playing a team whose whole objective with no huddle is to establish the tempo of the game and keep you off balance. Rohan Davey under center at the 28, hands it away to Tofield, slips a tackle at the 30, turns it upfield 25, 20, 15, runs over man 10, 5, he's going to score! Touchdown! I remember because I drove my man like like 20 yards down the field, and as and as I look to the, like outside of my helmet, I see him running over another guy and getting into the end zone, and I mean, it's like... Wow, I mean, at the time it's wow, but then you think about it, that's a brand of Tofu. I mean, that's supposed to happen. Actually, it was kind of a busted play. Uh, I don't know which defensive guy came off and made me, uh, you know, change direction and go to the outside. And then, I don't know, I just saw that end zone. It was wide open and... It was a play that we thought we had a chance coming in where we were just running a stretch play. It was a lead play. They were what we call bold defense and even front defense. We got in a slot formation, which which kind of helps us on those on those type of fronts. And they were basically blocked up like this with the backers inside with the strong safety here in the corner here. Well, we became up a guy with a bubble right here. So we were trying to run a stretch play where he was here. We were double teaming this guy and really moving him off the ball to here. We were trying to match block this and then create everybody on the scoop block coming across. And Tofield hit it and he bounced outside and the receivers and everybody did a great job. We got great movement up front. Then once he got a lane and then there was one little corner left to make a play and a 160-pound guy and a 230-pound guy, you're going to win most of the time, and that's what happened. Anytime you play an in-state rival, uh, there, there's a certain amount of bragging rights that go with that that may be a little bit more important to the fans uh, than to the actual players because we don't play that game every year. We let out as much as we had to. You know, it wasn't that we were going to come out and just show everything and give you everything because 
In our eyes, that was a game that we should have won easily. The Tigers rolled up an impressive 506 yards of offense against a surprisingly tough Utah State team on their way to a 31-14 victory over the Aggies. There are certain games that are scary games for you as a coach, that you have a difficult time trying to find a reason why your players would be motivated. And the Utah State game was one of those types of games. Utah State had some pretty good running backs. So, I mean, it's not like they were, you know, in cakewalks. They kind of, they ran the ball a little more than, than we thought they would. Uh, but they also spread it out also, you know, across the field with different receivers and different formations to kind of keep us off balance with everything that we were trying to accomplish. Yeah, I didn't even know where Utah was. I was, but, but uh, they were a good football team. They, they were a better football team, actually, than we planned on, I think. I don't think as coaches, I know I didn't probably give them their respect coming in, and I probably didn't do a good job of preparing my kids for them. But I thought they were very well coached. And as I followed them during the season, if they'd have been able to play a lick of defense, they just, they did, they were terrible on defense, but they really, really played well on offense. Suddenly, tragedy. In an instant, our world changed. America had been attacked. Like the rest of us, these young men were angry and confused. But like families across America, they came together and began to heal. Well, we were all in the office working, you know, that morning when it happened and somebody came in and said, you know, they just, you know, flew an airplane into the World Trade Center and it was kind of a, a shock and no one really realized the magnitude, you know, of, of, of what just transpired. Uh, and I don't think that um, any of us really realized the stress at that time that it was going to create for individuals everywhere, uh, including the players and the students at the school. It was a typical day, you know, going to class and um, came in the locker room and all the television sets were on and guys were talking about, you know, the plane crash into the building and this and that. And I looked at it and saw and it, it looked like something that you saw at the movies, you know, something, just a horrible picture. And I couldn't understand at the time why would whatever reason you're mad at someone or mad at a country, why would you just take it out on innocent people and thousands of innocent people? My son was across the street from uh, the towers. And so uh, it was a difficult time for me, actually, personally. It was a very difficult time for my wife and, and certainly for our son. I have a little girl and her mom lives in New York. She just moved up there. And I mean, the emotion, I was, I was scared, I was like, you know, how can people do this? Why would they do it? We just went out because they didn't cancel the game until like Thursday or Friday. And we just went out and we had practice as, as usual. And it was a little different out there just trying to focus on practice because even coach could tell that everybody's mind was kind of on the, the situation that happened in, in New York and in Washington. We didn't really know if we were going to play that week. I don't think anybody really cared if we were going to play that week. You know, whatever they told us to do, we would have would, done. But I think it was good that we didn't play. We got to be with our families. Coach gave us the whole weekend off, you know, and we just got to do what we wanted to do, just be with family and friends. I think it was good. I supported the fact that we were going to play, but I also supported the fact that we weren't going to play. Uh, so you talk about speaking with forked tongue. I guess I did it that week, but because I did, you know, we had no previous experience, you know, in this type of event and how we should respond to it. Um, but the tragedy of it all and the stress that it created, I think, was a very difficult management with all teams. We had prepared for the Auburn game, 
and didn't find out till Thursday when we were going out to practice, which at that time we'd already put everything that we were going to do in for that game plan, that we weren't going to play the game. And that was a real big game in terms of the first SEC game. Auburn has kind of grown into a rivalry here uh, because of the division, divisional play, and it usually comes early in the season. Uh, so I think it was a, a, a bit of a letdown for the players uh, that we weren't going to play the game. But I also think behind it all, the players had a lot of questions about how what happened would affect them. Uh, and they ask a lot of questions that surprised me. Like, what's the draft like? Is there a possibility that I could get drafted? Could, you know, I mean, things like that that, you know, I never thought that a player would even be thinking. Coach Saban uh, and I brought in a, a stress therapist from uh, you know, NASA to talk to the players and to put it into a perspective regarding you know, how they feel as football players. I think that thing affected all of us, you know, and, uh, and uh, when it kind of sunk in, yeah, I think it was a lot of, you know, there was so much exposure on TV and there were so many stories that came out of it and everything, you know, I, that it still affects me, you know, that I see the stories on TV, but, but uh, I think that they, it was tough on them just like it was everybody else. By playing these two games and then having a the game canceled and having three weeks, it was like there's still an unknown out there. You know, what kind of team are we really uh, in terms of, um, and you know, we were picked to win the West, and in some ways, you know, that was all created by what had been accomplished the year before. So, you know, there were still a lot of questions about this team, and I think there were still a lot of questions in the player's mind, you know, as to how good a team we really had. And that Auburn game was going to be kind of a, the test that actually told us a lot about ourselves. And now that had to get postponed for what amounted to almost three weeks until we went to play Tennessee. And it was probably in everybody's mind a little bit easier to have that test at home than it would be on the road. Marker. One, two, three, boom, about right there. It's a way of life. It's not a job. And, and you, to me, you have to approach it like that. So your family kind of gets conditioned to there's certain times when you're going to be around and there's certain times when you're not going to be around. T. Phillips, what's up, dog? You're supposed to be smiling today, man. It's cool and breezy. This is Tiger Sports Line with LSU head football coach Nick Saban. Hey, I went home. She tried to put me to work last night, and I said I can't do it. Boo! All right. <laughs> How's your knee today? Is that right? Yeah, we we weren't we didn't have a zip we usually have in practice. Let's go, Tiger! About to get in my little zone, my game day zone, man. Kind of have the theory that we want to silence the crowd and not be affected by the crowd. Just relaxing, get our mind right, be ready to play. This is a weekly thing right here. <sighs> Try the other side. We got it. Ooh. Ooh. Game time, baby. Game time. <laughs> And sometimes, I have to be honest, that I spend so much time with other people's children, I wonder if I'm spending enough time with my own. After an emotional pause in the season, the Tigers traveled to Knoxville in late September to take on the Tennessee Volunteers and join teams across America who were struggling to find a way to carry on the season. The Tigers surged early, but tough second-half play handed them their first loss. The big challenge going to Tennessee was our players were number one confident because we'd beaten them the year before here in what was a great game, an overtime game. Uh, but they had confidence that they could win the game. Uh, and it was the first game that we had to play on the road, and we were going to be able to maintain this intensity uh, in this environment that we were going to have to play in and compete in. So, and there were still a lot of unknowns out there because we hadn't played an SEC game. And I was really proud of the way our players competed in the game. I mean, we came out there very pumped up. We know we were playing Big Tennessee. And it was something like, for, for myself, my first experience ever to 
being a stadium that size compared to ours. And I mean, we was very motivated. We was ready to play. We've been off a long time and after September the 11th, and we was ready to go out there and just show everybody that, you know, we, we could be one of the best teams out there in the country. Tennessee was a great football team. And I think we're going to see that when the NFL draft comes out, <laughs> that some of the guys that got drafted on their defensive group, we had some opportunities early in the game to even make a few more big plays. And they were just so good up front that it was hard to hold them out that long. And that's not, a, you know, any down on, on our offensive linemen. That, that's just how good those guys were. And here comes a man in motion to the near side. Play action fake. Davey steps up in the pocket, looks and throws it way downfield. Got a man absolutely wide open. He's got it. 20-15. He'll score. That is Michael Clayton, the freshman, wide open. 76 yards. The Tigers score on the big one. We actually thought they would cover this and we would get Josh Reed in the middle of the field wide open. Well, it so happened that Josh drew such, you know, Josh was over here and Mike was over here. Josh drew such attention as he always does. They ran down to take him, and all of a sudden, you know, Roe looks up to make the read. Mike's standing at the other end of the field wide open. I mean, but it's a, re it's a progression in the play, but generally people take away deep and give you short. Well, it just happened in that scenario because of who 25 was, he drew so much attention that, you know, 14 was able to make the big play. Roe saw it, and we were able to complete the ball and, and got it downfield and made, it, and made a huge play. Physically, we beat him up. We just didn't, our offense, we didn't sustain through the mid part of the game. Came out strong, score went up, went at halftime, 7-6. Came back out, we kind of flustered, fluttered around third quarter. Really didn't get anything going on offense. Then when we saw that, we were still in the game, but time was running out. And that's when we kind of turned it up and started getting after them again. You know, but by then it was too late. We fought back and didn't give up, man, but that was one of them games where you just look back at it and say, man, we, you know, we could have won that game in Knoxville in front of 100 plus on national television. It was just two very, very good football teams coming out and making plays, and as we see later in the year, it turned out to be the two teams playing for the championship, and that's what happens when good teams play. I felt like we really competed well, and I thought that was a good sign and a very positive sign, even though we lost that game, I felt like we had a good football team and could be a really good football team. Uh, but our players felt like they put a little bit too much stock in the fact that we lost the game. And I was trying to reinforce the process of how they played the game, even though we didn't win, and that was something that we could build on. Uh, I think they were so disappointed that they didn't win that game, that I didn't think we really prepared well and competed as poorly as we have in all the games that we've played since I've been here the next week against Florida. Back in Tiger Stadium for the first time since 9-11, fans and teams alike adjusted to tighten security. On the field, United States Senator John Bro urged the country forward and LSU honored legendary coach Charles McClendon. At halftime, the Tiger Band removed their hats for the first time in their celebrated history and saluted America with a moving rendition of Amazing Grace. But the Tigers were no match for the Gator attack. It's not about playing well to me, it's about competing well. Uh, but we didn't compete well in the Florida game. We got behind early. Uh, we didn't play with any confidence. Um, you know, we, we just didn't look like ourselves. I mean, we, we almost played scared in the game, like we were play, playing to keep from getting beat rather than playing to win. When you play Florida, you know you're in for a fight. I just felt like they were kind of like toying with us like we were in a video game. Like we line up in this and they just had the perfect audible, the perfect check for it like every time. They had an answer for us. They really did. And, and you know, uh, Coach Spurrier does a great job of the passing game, and uh, they had an answer that day. They just, uh, they beat us, actually. I mean, we, we, uh, we, we got beat. Third and 10, Davey drops to throw. Now he's being chased out of the pocket and goes down for a big loss at the 23-yard line. And he's not getting up either. It was just a straight drop back pass, you know. Dropped back pass, the pocket broke down, tried to get out, and took a 
just took a direct blow on my knee. You know, nothing that was like torn or anything that of that sort, like when I tore my ACL, nothing like that. But more so just a direct blow that just weakened my knee. And when I took it, I went down and came off and I went out and um, got it checked out. And you know, it felt okay. Then I went back out and just couldn't, I couldn't get the ball back to the running back. So I, I, t I called and I took myself out. I mean, I just couldn't, I couldn't push off on it. You might not see it, but everybody got that thought in their mind. It's like, oh no, you know, Rohan's down. What are we gonna do now? So. And then when Matt came in and gave us that spark, you know, I was like, all right, yeah, let's play, you know, because he's fire. He wanted to go. He was excited in the huddle and was ready to play. The, the game had already kind of been decided at that point. Uh, they were up by pretty much. Um, but as I could tell just kind of in guys' eyes a little bit that they were kind of looking to say, oh, I wonder how Matt's going to do or, you know, I wonder if he's going to be able to, to perform. Well, they, they, they were hot that day. I mean, Grossman couldn't miss, and, and it seemed like uh, – any slight mistake we made, they capitalized on. And against a team like Florida, of course, you've got to minimize any mistake you ever make because of their athleticism and they're all well coached. They were putting so many points up on the board, and you know, uh, we had some turnovers in that game, and you know, that really killed us. So, um, you know, after so many touchdowns, I guess I, you know, I hope, yeah, they kind of got shot down a little bit. And now, the week before, where I felt like we had a lot of confidence, or I had a lot of confidence, and the staff had a lot of confidence in the way we competed and the chemistry we had. Now there were a tremendous amount of concerns about what kind of football team do we really have? Because great teams usually don't play games like that game. Marker? Nice day to practice, though. What did you say, Hojo? Yeah. Straight stretch in the middle! Break down! When you write a letter to a player and you cursing them out in that letter, when you get on the morning show or whatever it is and you cursing out a player, talking bad about him, that really affects that guy. Tiger Jacks team running! Yeah. Tiger Jacks team running! Yeah. Exercise! Well, one of the things that, uh, that was special about this team was Rohan Davey. The best moment of the season for me was probably when, um, Josh won the Belitnikov. And I look back and I see that we need to go to that side, but the place called it here. So I turn around and check Opie. Check Opie. The defense really rallied when Rohan Davy performed well. And we always had a, a, a point that you would focus on. Either it would be the shoulder or the neck and you would attack that point. No, if, if it scared me, I shouldn't be out there playing. His helmet went one way, the ball went another way. Your, your best shots are always in the beginning. I got down in my stance one time and threw up all over myself. Is that funny? <laughs> Rohan Davey returned to lead the Tigers in play against a stubborn Kentucky team. The Wildcats fought hard, tormenting the LSU defense with two quarterbacks. But the Tigers rallied behind Davey with a game-winning score in the final seconds of the game. After the Florida game, I was very disappointed and very concerned about the direction and what we needed to do and felt like maybe we needed to make some changes uh, and that the leadership and the chemistry of the team um, you know, needed to, to, to get a little jolt. You know, sometimes you need a thunderbolt um, to, you know, kind of re-energize things. And, and I felt like we needed that at that time, and I thought there was a lot of doubt in our team, you know, going to Kentucky. Yeah, you know, uh, that was when we almost let slip away from it, you know. It was way to go down there at the end of the game and win it at the end. And we felt like, you know, um, not to take anything away from Kentucky, but we felt like that, we should have, uh, it shouldn't have been that close to the game. You know? Kentucky wasn't a team that we thought would push us to the wire, you know, but SEC got to be ready every week. So that was an eye opener for us to get our stuff together. Uh, and even though we played well in the game, 
we could never knock them out. We were ahead 19 to 3, opportunity to score, didn't score. We were ahead 22 to 10, had an opportunity to score, didn't score. So we never could knock them out. And then they got the game back to 22-17 on the flute play, which we jumped off sides. We thought the whistle blew, everybody stopped, they threw a touchdown pass. So now you're on the road, the momentum of the game changes. Uh, they bring Lorenz in as a quarterback at some point in time in this comeback, and you know we're in a dogfight. Uh, but I think the, the drive uh, that we had at the end of the game to win the game in, in two minutes. Me and Roe came into the huddle and said, we're not losing this one. There's no way we're fixing to lose this game. And we marched the ball down the field and scored. And I feel like that, that brought us together, you know, a little more so we could get ready for the second half of the season. The shotgun, there's the snap. Davies looking, he throws, and it is caught! Touchdown! The touchdown play to... The backers were just plussed over to Josh's side, and the safety was on that side. So, I mean, the window was right there for Mike to get into, and all I had to do was basically drop back and look off and then come. I mean, I knew the spot, and all Mike had to do was get into the spot. He did a great job of working and getting the corner off balance and getting inside, but the corner did a good job of coming back across and trying to slap it down. And, you know, fortunately enough, it was low, and Mike went down and made the catch. And we had actually thrown this play probably about seven or eight times in the game. And it was, it was an all slant play, in other words. We were running a slant here, slant here, slant here, and slant here. Well, this is Josh, this is Michael, this is uh, Jarrell, and this is Corey Webster. Of course, uh, then the running back was right here, but we knew we were throwing the football. Well, when we had the two one-on-ones right here, we knew which side we were working. Our first option was to look for Josh. He takes his slant, they jump. And Josh, being as unselfish as he is, like we talk about, sharing the ball around. He knows, he goes to run his route, they jump him. He, instead of trying to work really hard to get open, he kept pressing and pulling inside. Well, all that did was open up the window for Mike on the outside. Mike did a great job because the corner was inside. Mike pressed him hard for three steps outside, got his hips turned, slanted right back underneath of him. Roe makes a picture perfect throw. And the line did a great job of getting the hands down of everybody up front and we were able to win the game. If you're not out there catching balls or uh, you know, scoring a touchdown, there are the other intangibles that you can do as far as blocking or, you know, if you can run a route and get, get your man open and you run it, you know, to get your man open, just little things like that. And <clears throat> I think that's what helps, you know, uh, someone be a complete player. Uh, and to see the players respond to the win and the way we won was probably the best thing that could happen to us at that point in the season. And I think that had a lot to do with us coming back together as a team uh, and I had done a lot of work that week on a lot of other players taking ownership for the team and trying to be more assertive as leaders uh, and get more people involved in some of the responsibility issues when it comes to ownership and what kind of team we were really going to have. In Starkville, Mississippi, the Tiger defense got its first shutout of the season against the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Along the way, Josh Reed passed the 2,000 career yards receiving mark, and LSU offered fans a powerful first and second half performance. We had a big emphasis to go on the road and dominate a game to be dominant on the road. Uh, we had never really done that since we'd been here. Uh, we'd only won one game on the road, and that was Ole Miss, you know, in the first year since we'd been here. The history of winning the two previous years on the road uh, was pretty dismal as well. You know, Coach Saban challenged us that week to try to put a whole game together in a hostile environment against a good team. And Mississippi State was a good team. They had a real good defense, a confusing defense. They tried to confuse the quarterback and pride themselves on forcing the quarterback to make bad plays. Well, if you can run the ball versus blitzing teams and aggressive teams up front, you neutralize that, make them stop doing it as much, and then allow your quarterback to have some time to throw the ball. Because I don't care who you are, if they keep blitzing you enough, and they can always bring more people than you can block, 
And, and you know, sometimes people say, well, that's only a three-yard gain. But that three-yard gain sends a message when you're running the ball and pounding it, being physical up front, letting your linemen come off the ball where they're not always catching guys, blitzing at them. They get to come off and hit them in the mouth, slow them down. And your quarterback gets a time to rest, and then they can't always blitz on every down. So then you pick your moments to throw and allows them to be successful in the throwing game. So being able to run it versus Mississippi State was as big a key and set up all the big pass plays that we had during the game. I mean, the whole week, Coach Fisher challenged me and let me know that, look, you know, you're going to be hitting the mile. You had to stand there and take some, you know, take some shots. But when the opportunity comes, you got to make the plays. And, you know, that was a focus all week. And that's exactly how it turned out, exactly how we said it, because, I mean, we made some mistakes, but when they gave us the opportunity, we took it. It was a Southeastern Conference head knocker for a half of that ball game. I mean, that thing, that thing was a physical, go get them ball game. And they were giving a great, great effort. We were able to, just in the th early third quarter, get some points on them and, and get up on them a little bit in, in, uh, and get our confidence up and theirs down. Everybody talked about they're gonna run over us. They're very physical, big guys up front. And we showed them from the first snap of the game. You know, what we was here to do. I mean, we was on the road and we was going to prove something, you know. We said we wanted to be a dominant team. And that game was a game that we played dominant as a team. Well, Mississippi State, we just seemed like we just came out there and we just, we just got in the zone. You know, it's like everything was clicking and, you know, uh, it seemed like we couldn't do anything wrong. Probably one of the most physical games that we had all year long. But to get a shutout on defense, I think, is always something that's uplifting to the players and uh, I thought we probably played our best defensive game to that point in the season in that game. Marker? In the in the midst of the heat of the battle. Man, yeah, right quick with my channel. I'm almost old as my champ. If you can see the battle. You've got to be able to be calm. Get this thing going, go, go! And say, this is what we're gonna do. This is our twins. 92 smash. Got to keep believing. Defense going to make something happen right here. We come. Let's get this party started. We have rules where when we condition our football team, their hands are behind the line. And if you're, if we see one person with their hand over the line, then the entire football team is going to do an extra rep. You ready to go? Let's go! I hit Ed Chester my freshman year and blew his knee out. Right. Elbows high. Good job. Every day it's like this. I want a sandwich. If I'm like this, and I bend, my shoulders are over my feet. It, it can happen. If you make one wrong step, ah! you can get hooked and they can be out, you know, around the corner for 60 yards. Woo! I should have played receiver. LSU returned home to face the Ole Miss Rebels and red-hot quarterback Eli Manning. But the Tigers lost a fourth quarter lead and an important SEC game. After the disappointing loss, Coach Nick Saban celebrated his 50th birthday on Halloween night at his weekly radio show and emotionally defended his Tiger team. Afterwards, the players turned to themselves and put their faith in us 11, writing this pledge on their wristbands as a reminder that they could only be successful together. For whatever reasons, and this is the consistency factor uh, that bothers you as a coach, that every time you feel like you establish something with your team, something happens to disappoint you. And after winning a Kentucky game and seeing that thunderbolt of excitement because of the way we won the game internally with the players, and then to go to, Ole Miss, to, go to Mississippi State and dominate the game, which was our goal. Now you feel like you're on a little bit of a roll that you'll come out against Ole Miss, who's a good team, who's 5-1 and one or 6-1 and one when we play them, and the players will be excited to practice and get ready for the game and have a great week of preparation and all those types of things, and we were flat as a pancake all week long. You know, we played that game to keep from getting beat, and that's not the best way we played as a team. I know defensively we didn't play uh, up to up to our potential, and uh, you know it's a bad memory. It is. It's a it's a memory of a of a game that 
could have, should have, and would have if we, I think if we would have played, I would have liked to have played our best game to see who could win that game. We, we weren't up for the game. I don't know why. It was a huge game. I don't know why we weren't up for it, but it's just one of those games. And there was nothing we could do. After it was over with, we had to just forget about it and move on, and that's what we did. Yeah, credit on us for having a good game, but I guess it, it just felt like it was one of those nights, you know, you could come in one game like Mississippi State and, you know, everything's going right, and then you might have a game where, um, you know, it seems like nothing's going to go right. And, you know, Miss, uh, Ole Miss Day came to play that night, and, I, you know, I don't think we played like we should have, and that's, I think that's why they were, they, they were able to be. They did a very good job of moving up front and stemming and, and creating some, I guess, confusion among our guys, and we were turning guys loose, and then when we did have, and then when you turn guys loose, we're moving, and a few times we do block them up and do, and we got guys open, we're just missing them, just out of rhythm, and never found that rhythm or that sink. And Tofield not being able to play in that game because this was the weakest team in terms of run defense and the strongest team in terms of pass defense. And to take our runner, who was a power guy against a smaller, quicker defense, out of that game was probably uh, a matchup that would have been something that would have been in our favor had he been able to play. Things weren't too tense, man. You know, we, we weren't too tense after the Ole Miss law. We weren't, I mean, we were upset naturally, but we weren't, you know, we took it as a, as a loss. You know, it wasn't anything that we looked like and we let an opportunity slip by and stuff like that. You know, the media and everybody like that made it seem that way. And certain guys, the leaders of the team, just had to be like, look, man, we can still reach all our goals. Everything that we want to do, we can still accomplish. We just got to go out and win football games. And that's basically what we did. We had a team meeting, well, a players meeting. And then we just decided all to come together, not to worry about what's going to happen. Let's just win. <laughs> it was funny. Because after that, Coach Saban looked back at the end of the season when we were playing Arkansas and Auburn, and he was like, you know, if you thought about it, guys, all the teams that have looked forward to what could happen if they win have lost, you know. And he was talking about Florida looking forward if they beat Tennessee, then they lost. You know, Oklahoma losing. You know, Nebraska losing to Colorado. All that took place like the same week. And, you know, that's funny now that I look back on it that, that's what we were doing, looking forward to what if we beat Ole Miss, then we put ourselves in this position, and then we ended up losing. The Tigers responded in glory as records fell against the Alabama Crimson Tide. Josh Reed claimed the SEC record for receptions and yards, while Rohan Davey shattered the LSU passing mark, and LeBrandon Tofield rushed for three touchdowns. Alabama was no match for the Tigers. Well, I think the Alabama game was, was, uh, was what I call judgment day, you know, to our players because we were four and three at this point. Uh, lost a tough game to Ole Miss, lost a tough game to Tennessee. So we had two losses in the conference. And, uh, you know, I just felt like it was judgment day for our team that, that are we going to be the kind of team that we're capable of being, uh, or are we going to be just mediocre? And what are you willing to make out of this season? All right, and it was judgment day. And it's for you guys to decide, you know, whether you want this season to be a success uh, or not. And I was so proud of the way we played in the Alabama game. We uh, all got together as a team, you know, no coaches, just the players. and. You know, we, we talked and we decided, you know, it's either one or two things. You know, we let the season go by, you know, we just lost Ole Miss and we could just let the season, the season continue to be like that or we could turn this thing around, you know, we could win out, you know, the rest of our games and we'll still have a chance. Alabama's always one that gets a hair on the back of my neck up uh, because, of, you know, they are, they've been one of the premier programs for a long time. and. You know, as I came my 22 years in the Southeastern Conference, uh, Coach Bryant and that group spanked me a lot of times, you know, and we were ready to play Alabama, I think, on both sides of the ball, and, and really just played well from beginning to end. Kentucky had the drive of the year. Alabama was the game of the year. That was the game that we're going to have to sell. We're going to have to make our minds up. What kind of football team are we going to be? How are we going to play? And, 
And just and we knew we couldn't control our own destiny in a way. All we had to do was just play one game at a time as we went out and see what happens. So we were going to be very aggressive and try to use our people. And you know, one of the ways we did it was with the, the bubble screen. Uh, we spread the field. Again, Josh is, a, is such a good player. And we use this formation here a bunch. Right, lone receiver near side, shotgun again on first down this time. Davey tosses it over. It is caught by Reed. He's at the 45 50. Well, what we were trying Alabama to do territory. was create a numbers game. Alabama would play in their scheme. They had very good front people. So that's one of the reasons we didn't try to bunch it in as much because the more guys we put in there, the more they did. And they were a big physical football team and, 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 and uh, playing. So what we looked for out here was the matchup. The safety is awesome. We looked for three guys on two. If they left it like this, we just match blocked it. Josh just bubbled out. We ran, ran our route back here. We full blocked him. He came across like it was a run and just threw it to him. We had two blockers with a ball carrier out wide and Josh was catching the ball. And you know, and when they did walk out and take it away, we would run the ball back inside or if they overload the coverage down, then we threw one-on-one -on -one to Mike on the backside. So again, Mike being a big part of why Josh was having a lot of success in that game, and then, and also Toefield, that when they would walk out and totally ignore, we would just check to the run. It was Josh Reed, uh, Alabama day. <laughs> it was funny because that game, my roommate, Eric Alexander, he uh, came up to me before the game and he was like, he said, he was like, man, that'd be tight, you get 200 yards this game. I'm like, yeah, man, you know, that would be, you know, pretty cool. Alabama was just basically a, a game where we just went out and hung loose, you know. Defense played great. You know, offensively, Coach Fisher put together a game plan like he always have that made us go out there and utilize our weapons. More records fell as Middle Tennessee came to Death Valley with something to prove and left empty-handed, guaranteeing the Tigers a winning season with the SEC West title clearly in their sights. Middle Tennessee is a tough opponent because they were probably the best out-of-conference opponent that we played from a talent standpoint. And I just have a real pet peeve about playing these non-conference games late in the season when you're knee deep into the SEC. It's a tough motivation for your players. Middle Tennessee had a good football team and had played very well against some teams that we were familiar with. And uh, I'm, I really personally would think, and I, I don't know about the other side of the ball, about their defense as much as I know about their offense, but I think it's one of the best offensive football teams that we've played. And again, another no huddle football team. I knew that Middle Tennessee, who had played Ole Miss, you know, really well earlier in the year, was a very capable team from a talent standpoint. Uh, but I was very pleased with the way we played and competed in the game. And, um, you know, against a much better football team than what people probably gave them credit for coming in. Uh, and I was just happy to get out of there with a win. In the traditional battle for the boot, the Tigers met Arkansas on a Friday afternoon in Tiger Stadium, rolling up over 500 yards of offense to beat a tough Razorback team. As other SEC games fell the right way, the Tigers were now in contention for the SEC West title. Arkansas was a difficult, difficult preparation because of the option that they ran, the two quarterback system that they ran, um, you know, from a defensive standpoint. And with all the junk that they do on defense, uh, and John Thompson is a fine player, and I refer to it as junk not in a negative way, but it's a very difficult preparation for all the stunts and blitzes and games that they run uh, for our offensive team. Uh, it was a very scary game for us in terms of preparation. Arkansas, man, it's just one of them games, man, that you like, we're not going to lose this game, you know, and everyone had that attitude, even when things went bad, the team, the coaches, the trainers, 
you know, everybody that was on the sideline was all upbeat and all positive. And you knew it just had to turn out that guy attitudes on the line on the sidelines were if something's going bad, let's turn it around. We're not losing this game. And you know, that was the one thing that came out of it and everybody was just so positive, coaches, everybody. Second and 10, LSU at their 38 yard line, opening possession of the ball game. Myers and Reed flanked to the far side, now an eye formation with uh, LeBrandon Tofield as the running back. Davey looks around, looks to the far side, goes under center on second and 10. Hands the ball away, Tofield across the 40, 45 midfield, he's in the clear! It's a foot race, 25, 20, he'll take the distance, nobody will catch him. It was caught in the middle of a stem while we when we started the playoff and the guy he was trying to like come across and I, I really caught him off balance and I was driving him I, I had an angle going this way and all all he had was the see I saw the safety out of the corner of my eyes coming up and when I threw threw him to the ground the safety kind of got hooked up into all, all, all you know both me and him and he fell down and LeBrandon went untouched to, into the end zone and he, like I said that pull away speed that we always talked about they kind of played it to well, they brought a blitz to the left, and we ran the draw to the right, and it was only one guy there, and he missed the tackle. And me, with my slow self, you know, made it down the sideline. 45, 50 seconds left. Plenty of time for Arkansas the way happens. they've been playing to get in position. All right, the Tigers have three receivers to the far side, one to the near side. Looks like they're lining up in a shotgun and may throw the ball. Waiting on the snap, there it is. Davey looks to throw, and he does, and it is caught. That is a Josh Reed, still on his feet, still on his feet, 40, he's down to the 36. What a like a minute, play. 20 seconds to go. They had no timeouts. I said, Coach, we run the ball. It was third and nine, or third and 11, I believe. I said, if we run it, we can run the clock down to 40 seconds, punt it and see. He said, nah, he said, Roe and Josh are our guys. You know, we're throwing the ball. That's what we do very well. Let's do what we do well, and if we lose, we're going to lose what we do, we're doing what we do very well. I kind of thought we were going to throw the football, you know, because it was a lot of other times Coach Fisher showing some confidence in me and put it in my hands and just wanted me to make a play. But when it came in and it, we called the play, it was in the huddle where we called the play, and uh, we looked at each other. And, I mean, you, we knew when the play came in and when we got in the huddle and called, I mean, I knew I was going with the ball, you know, and. It was just a matter, I just told the man, look, get open. This is the game right here. You get open, we hit this, the game over. You know, and Josh a big time player, he made a big time play. I told him, you know, uh, no, I want, the, I want the ball, give me the damn ball. Coach Fish used to call me Keyshawn because he said, uh, if I didn't get the damn ball, I'd pout. And which is true, you know, but I always took that, 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 that was a plus, you know, again, you know, I, I like to make things happen, so give me the damn ball. You know, it was just one of the things you drop back and you see the whole thing open up. I mean, you see it open up and it's just a matter of you just letting it go and putting it in there, right? And then you just watching the ball go, you watching it go and then it's caught and, you know, game time. Rohan Davey has always shown uh, a propensity to do that. Josh Reed has always showed a propensity to do that. And we have several other players on offense who have been able to do that throughout the season uh, who we had great confidence in. And we had the two previous series, Arkansas had scored touchdowns in a two-minute style offense pretty quickly uh, and shredded our pass defense uh, pretty easily. Uh, so I felt like if we were going to take a chance with a minute two left to go in the game, uh, we should do it with our best players and play to our strength. And on third and 13, decided to throw the ball to get a first down to win the game, and we did. So it was a great play call, whoever called it. You know, I give both of them the credit, whoever called it. The LSU-Auburn rivalry intensified as word reached the Tiger locker rooms before kickoff that Auburn had received a penalty involving the nationally recognized center field Eye of the Tiger. A halftime standoff between the LSU band and a stubborn Auburn kicker further fueled the frenzied fans. But the Tigers refused to yield, winning the SEC West title and advancing to their first ever Southeastern Conference Championship game in Atlanta. 
the Tigers motivational film that week said it all about these warring Tigers. It showed over the previous years where Auburn was victorious against us and they had smoked cigars on the field. Uh, the year before uh, Coach Saban's first year, they stopped the clock with a few seconds to go on the clock to score a touchdown at the end of the game. And we had put this tape together, which was an outstanding tape and a motivating tape for us. And there was no love loss between LSU and Auburn. Everyone knew what time it was when Auburn came to town. I mean, it was, it, it was, that was the game where we probably had the least pep talk. We had nobody saying nothing, everybody focused. Because everybody knew, you know, this is a team that disrespected us, and we're going to get our respect back tonight. Well, we were just fired up. We had so much on the line. This is just, this is what it's about, man. You just out here, you don't have to depend on anybody else to win a game to help to get you to the SEC championship game. You don't have to depend on anybody else. It's all on you. At the end of the day, all that you can look at is yourself in the mirror and know that, you know, you won it or, you know, you lost it. Oh, that was like a slap in the face. We wanted to go out there and uh, probably wanted to fight him before the game started, you know, just for the fact that, you know, they came on our field and they're lighting cigars. And, you know, we always played them, like I said, the third week of the season when, you know, we're just starting. But, you know, we were stronger at this time. And, uh... We were just ready. And even though I thought, based on September 11th, that it was a disadvantage to our team at the time not to play Auburn that particular week, because I think it would, would have set up our season a little bit better uh, if we were able to beat them early on to gain some confidence in the SEC, knowing that we had Tennessee and Florida, who are both two top five teams, you know, that, that we were going to play back to back, that it was a disadvantage that we didn't play the game. I think it was a tremendous advantage to us to be able to play them at the end of the year uh, for the championship because it is somewhat of a rivalry. Uh, there is a little bit of bad blood there. So there was no doubt that the combination, combination of playing for the Western Conference championship and playing Auburn for it was going to be a real positive uh, motivating factor for our team and our players. And I thought we played and competed outstanding in the game. I mean, the physical, the, the hitting uh, was just the special teams play, uh, which, you know, we started the game with the onside. Corbella will kick it off from right to left. LSU and Auburn for the Western Division title. And we hope you enjoy it. 90,000 here in Tiger Stadium tonight. And it is a pop-up. And the Tigers caught it. Is it far enough downfield? It was. Yes, it is. And you're absolutely right on an onside kick to start the ball game. I considered it in several games because John Corbello was very good at making the kick. Uh, but sometimes when you get a penalty on a kickoff, you know, there's less risk involved in taking a chance because even if you don't get it, you're not giving up that much in field position. We were, hands down, a better football team than Auburn. And we knew it. And, uh, you know, it was funny. Because Coach kind of runs things by me sometimes when he does them. And he goes, we're going to onside kick it. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, he won't be expecting it. And i like, if they don't make it, we're going to stop them anyway. You know, we just had confidence that night. And uh, I think by him doing that and then Michael Clayton coming down the next time and splitting some cat in half. Does. And he's hit it well. It's coming down at about the one yard line. Back up to the five, to the 10, to the 15. Oh, what a hit at the 15 yard line. I mean, we, it was a smooth seller from there. It showed that Coach Saban had faith in us, that we kind of all bonded as coaches, football players, everybody, community. It, you know, it was, it was our time. Hands to Tofield, and he is at the goal line, and he scores. And the Offensively, we wanted to get Tofield going that game. We didn't think, you know, they had some good linebackers and everything. They had like a good defensive line, McNeil. But we we really wanted to run the ball. That's what we wanted to do. And then we we just wanted to pound them and pound them and everything. And we we felt eventually they would have gave into us. And you know, with us just keep coming at them, coming at them and stuff. And at the end of the game, going through the game, you know, they had signs of weakness that you know they couldn't stop LeBron. And then every once in a while, Rohana complete a pass. And you know, we just everything was upbeat. You know, we, we was on our game. There's the snap, 
And the handoff to Tofield, looking for some place to go. 30, still on his feet, 25, down to the 20-yard line. He's in the slot over there. Nobody on the near side. And Davey is in the shotgun. Here comes the blitz. Davey's in trouble. He throws as he, and it's touchdown! Josh Reed! Side one to the near side. Here is a handoff. It's stood up at the line of scrimmage and thrown back. As this ball game with Auburn, you know, is, is a big rivalry as it is, but the, the Western Conference Championship is coming through this ball game. And, uh, you know, one of the things that kind of challenged me, you know, was that uh, LSU's never won it. And, and I, you know, I, I thought it would be a nice thing to to uh, be on the first one. And, and I'm sure they're going to win a lot more of them. But at that point in time, they had never done it. And and, uh, and I was that was one of the real challenges for me, one of the motivational things for me, that LSU's never won the Western Conference Championship. Marker? Yeah, you, know, you got to spend a lot of time studying the game if you want to be the best. You know, not wanting to be out there running in 100 degree weather. What's up, coach? Not wanting to be practicing with 30 pounds of pads on. Once the first game coming and you walking through the streets, and you're walking down the hill and the fans got signs and they touching you and high-fiving you and telling you, let's go. You know, that's one of the biggest thrills I've ever gotten. You're waiting a long time. It's going down tonight, coach. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I threw all my clothes, all my LSU stuff. I regret it now. I gave away my gloves, my chin strap. Somebody even wanted my mouthpiece. You know, I mean, I gave it all away. OK, what we do every week, we take a block, put it in the meeting room. If we win that game, everybody gets to sign it. Put them right here. Just. Count, I count my blessings every day, and you know, I know just as quick as it came, it, it can go. I'd like to pray that you bless this food for the nourishment of our body. It's going down tonight! It's going down tonight! The Tennessee Volunteers entered the championship game with a chance to play for the national title. LSU's hopes looked bleak when Davey and Tofield were lost to injuries. But backups Matt Mock and Dominic Davis led the Tigers to their first SEC title in 15 years. After the earlier loss to Tennessee, revenge was sweet for the Tigers. I think the SEC championship game is as fine a venue as I've ever participated in as a college coach or a pro coach. Um, to go to uh, the Georgia Dome and play a game in that kind of atmosphere I think is a great experience for all of us and it was a great experience for our players uh, but again I think that our players felt like sitting in this room on Monday after the the Auburn win that they felt like they could beat Tennessee. We basically told the kids the bottom line about the first ball game was four deep balls that were given up and if we don't give those games those gains up then it's a different ball game because we did a good job in the running game and we wanted to continue. We preached that. That was how we were going to win the game was to stop the run. And when you, when you go up in a championship ball game and give Tennessee 36 yards rushing, that's a heck of a performance. They couldn't run the ball against us. And if you can't run the ball in college football, you're going to have problems. And when we knew they couldn't run it. We were just, you know, getting after Clawson all day long. Man, I was, I was excited. You know, I, I went in and played the football game, you know. And things happen where you don't finish games sometimes, and that's how I took it. But, you know, like I told the lady at the hospital, when I was at the hospital, and Matt came in the game, and the lady was telling me, um, yeah, Tennessee's going to beat you guys, this and that. I told the lady, I said, look, Tennessee won't beat us tonight. We're going to win this game tonight. You know, everybody asked me, I said, I was running scared. That's basically what it was. Uh, like I said, Tennessee had a real good team, a real good defensive front. And, uh, you know, I'd gotten hit a couple times before that uh, in the game and didn't like it very much. So I was just trying to, to stay away from the big guys. That was what Matt could do well, so that's what we did. And then, then of course, then they got to worry about him, and then Dominique got to running, and then we hit a few passes, and it all came out and opened Dominique because he was a huge part of that, too, when it came out later in the game running the ball. So you know, that was what 
the guys in the game at that time could do well, so that's what we did. And the thing about it is we put in all them run plays, and the same week me and him were sitting down talking. I was like, man, you know, I ain't never scored a touchdown in college, man. He was like, well, all these plays Coach Fisher putting in, you're going to have a chance to score this week. Y'all get close to the goal line. You tucking and running up in there. So having his first really, you know, little significant, he scored two touchdowns. One of the most pivotal plays in the game, which most people would see as a negative, which I felt was the dumbest thing that I've ever done as a coach in 28 years was the way the game had gone, we played well early in the game, we were ahead in the game, and then two straight series, they had the ball, they scored, and completed long passes uh, to score one touchdown and to set up another score, so now they were ahead 14-7. We go in on offense, and I feel like we have to get the momentum of the game back, or we have to keep the momentum of the game from getting away from us at that point in time in the game. So we come up fourth and an inch on our own 23 or 24 yard line. And I say, let's go for it, take a chance, which, you know, I usually don't do because that's points for them if you don't make it. And we did it and got stuffed, and they got the ball on the 23 yard line. And we made them go backwards 12 yards defensively in that series, and they ended up kicking a field goal. So now the score is 17 to 7. And from that point on in the game, we go win the game 24 to 3. And for five minutes, I was stung on the sidelines that I had done something that was stupid, that was not fair to the players, that was a bad decision, that we should have never done because it put us in a bad position. What makes that game so special to me? Not only was it for the championship, but that we were down 17 nothing at one time. And, you know, it takes a special team, I think. And I think we had grown into, by that time, a special team. It takes a special team to be down 17 nothing in the championship game of Tennessee to a team that's already beaten you one time during the season. And to come back and do the things that our guys were able to do in that ball game on both sides of the ball. We, we outscored them 21 to three, I think, in the second half. So. So our offense did a great job in the second half, and defensively we were able to hold them to a field goal in the second half. And, um, and I really think, I mean, that's when I think about this team, um, one, of the, one of the things that's special about this team to me is the courage in that ballgame. Joe DiMaggio comes up to me at the end of the game and says, Coach, the call you made on fourth and inches to go for it gave us the confidence that we needed to win the game. That you had a not that much confidence that you would take that chance on us made us feel like we could win the game. So the dumbest thing that I've ever done turned out to be the smartest thing, but unbeknownst to me as to how people react sometimes to the things that you do. So that's the thing I remember most about the game. LSU's first ever bowl championship series game resulted in a record number of ticket requests for Louisiana's own Sugar Bowl. In the Superdome, an offensive explosion of 27 points in the second quarter allowed the underdog Tigers to run away from an overmatched Illini squad. As a rare light snow powdered Death Valley only 80 miles away across the Louisiana swamps, the Tigers raised the Sugar Bowl trophy in triumph. You know, Illinois had a fine team. There was no doubt about that. Uh, Quarterback-oriented teams had given us problems, given us problems, you know, through the course of the year. Uh, and they had a very good quarterback and very good skill guys. But uh, I thought, and we thought going into the game, that they didn't quite have the speed as a team that we typically play against and that they were going to have a difficult time matching up with our offensive players in terms of how they play defense and how they try to cover our skill guys. And for me, uh, the Sugar Bowl, because I recruit New Orleans, 
and have been recruiting New Orleans for 20 something years. So it was really a lot of fun to me to go to New Orleans and play in the Sugar Bowl for, uh, you know, for my last game. And so I was excited about it and, and I had been in Sugar Bowls before and I knew that it was a big time game. And, and uh, you know, there are only eight BCS teams. So you only got four teams that are going to win BCS ball games. So I think it puts you leaning on that next level. We rushed the passer, but when they did that K pass, you weren't going to get to him. So you might as well stop and get your hands up. And he told us that we would be able to block a bunch of balls if we did that. And I think <clears throat> we, all we can practice when we were in New Orleans, we worked on blocking passes, blocking passes. Every, you know, every period we emphasized that. And then when we got to the game and it started working, we, we believed in it. And I think it made a big difference in that first half blocking. The thing I think about the Illinois game was that our offensive line just did a great job of protecting. Like, I never really got touched against Illinois, you know. Our line did a great job, just like they did all through the year, and protected well. And against the Illinois, they really didn't get much rush. And when they did, we side adjust. And, but their corners just weren't as good as advertised. He played with a lot of consistency and played well and took advantage offensively of every circumstance that we could uh, to be ahead 34-7 at halftime. I think we lost a little bit of our momentum and they made some big plays on us and some plays that we couldn't have made allowed them to come back. But I still thought it was a, a tremendous victory, a tremendous win, a great memory you know, for everyone associated with uh, this football team. You know, when you play in a Sugar Bowl and, you know, you're at LSU, that uh, that's something, the result of that game, something you're going to remember for the rest of your life. So, um, you know, and for us to be able to beat three teams down the stretch uh, that were really, really good football teams, or really four, you know, in Arkansas, um, Auburn, Tennessee, and Illinois was a top 10 team uh, and really had to beat two top, team ten, top 10 teams back to back to accomplish what we did uh, was pretty significant. And for this team to end up the seventh ranked team in the country, it's something I'm very proud of. If you're competing in the SEC championship, you're as good as there is in the country. And that's the goal, you know, and the wins and losses, things happen, you know. All of us want to win every game, but that's the kind of quality program he wants to do. And it's not a program where, oops, we have a rebuilding and we go up and down. He's intent on building a program on solid foundation that they will continue to uh, get better every year. I, I have extremely high expectations, not only as a as a longtime supporter, but just your average fan. And Tell you what, I think you, you, you couldn't ask for a better year for uh, uh, football at LSU, and you couldn't want for anything better for the state. I mean, if you look at what the impact that football at LSU, all athletics at LSU has on the economy of Baton Rouge and the state and the, and the prestige of the university, it's just amazing. It was great. There is no venue in American sport, collegiate sport, or maybe sport, period, that's like Saturday night in Tiger Stadium. It's a very, very special spirit. It's a very special place. Uh, the fans are unbelievable. They're the best fans in the country. Uh, and the history and the aura and the legendary nature of that stadium is something that's uh, quite remarkable and I'm very proud of. And football did it this past year like no other way it could have been done. You take the, the Sugar Bowl with national television. You take the SEC championship game, national television. You take the delayed game with Auburn, national television, cable vision. You take the Arkansas game. You put all those games, you're giving exposure 
to LSU all over the country and probably the world. What really, uh, from a coach's standpoint, uh, makes me so happy with this season was the fact that things didn't look good, particularly after the old Miss game. And uh, it's a lesson for all of us. You know, never give up too soon because you can always come back. And then they rattle off six in a row. And if that weren't, wasn't enough, in the final championship game in the Georgia Dome, they play without their first string quarterback, without their first string tailback, and they still, you know, manage to overcome a team rated ahead of them. I think it was one of the greatest football games I've ever seen. I'm about as proud of this football team as I've ever been of any team here at LSU. Marker. Our football team now, they don't know anything but hard work and effort. Just the whole team part of it, being with somebody that you know. My head kind of dizzy, but I'm all right. If you're hanging off a 30-foot building, they'll do everything they can to hold you up and to make sure you don't fall. Victory for LSU! My dad said I lost my mind. My mom said I lost my mind. Uh, because I had spent all my life saying there's no way I was ever going to go into coaching. Whip. Yep, that would be good. Yeah, a good shot in. That would be real good. One of the jobs of a coach is to make sure that your players are always competing at the highest level possible. Blue, wait, set. And you can't accept anything but their very best effort. No, I got a test tomorrow, 250 pages. Because I saw the team every Sunday and every Monday, I just saw the intensity level increasing. Things were happening so fast, you know, we never really had time to sit there and, you know, actually realize what happened. <laughs> It was a tale of two seasons, one of questions, resolved with bold confidence, a team united by a pledge, success proven by a prize. It was the inside story about a great season. It was a story about football, the way it was meant to be played, the way it was meant to be coached, a true story about how the LSU Tigers became champions.